for making this great. Thanks, Sako. Thank you. Um, the agenda for today's session is Mastering Yourself, Driving Change. Our guest speaker is Aisha Agaiba. She is the IT Operations and Programs Lead at Google. Um, after I have presentation, we'll hear discussion, QA, and then, you know, the purpose for the session is to build our network, expand our network, share ideas, exchange notes. So, welcome again. I'll return to the QA. Hi, everyone. Uh, my, again, my name is Aisha. Thank you for having me here. And uh, still mentioned, I, I, I've been at Google for 15 years, almost 15 years now, and then I have no position before that. Outside of Google, um, I'm also uh, a president of a local nonprofit organization called the Georgia Gentle Cultural Society. Uh, not to say that I've had a lot of leadership roles, uh, but I've grown a lot in my career. I've grown a lot in my uh, in these adventures through the roles I have. And I wanted to use tonight more of a conversation forum for some thought-provoking questions and um, get us talking about these topics rather than imposing, imposing some wisdom that I don't really have. Um, it's more of the experiences that I have. All right, before we get started, and roughly the way I structured it was, before you can drive change in others, before you can drive change in the environment around you, you actually need to master yourself first. You need to figure yourself out, you need to master yourself, and then you can start thinking about what you can do in the environment around you. Um, I'll start with actually a bit of a personal story. Uh, when I was growing up, and I'm sure this is true for most of you, um, and even today, we hear oftentimes, um, someone is so smart, you're so smart, you're so talented. And what often, is not discussed is how the person became that. So my so those are pictures of my parents actually. Uh, my father was regarded as one of the best pilots. Uh, he was very skilled. He was very daring. Uh, he really used to come from the most complicated missions. My mother was a teacher for many years and became a superintendent of the school district, which was really difficult. Um, it, it was a difficult position to get to being um, being a male dominated in that space, but. Um, it wasn't because they were smart and talented. They both grew up very poor. They both grew up in very poor families. They struggled a lot. My father had to go through many, many, many tries to get into pilot academy. To be able, he actually got kicked out of the pilot academy a few times. But through many, many years, he managed to get himself back in there, pick it up, and then keep going. And same with my mother, who Work main jobs, uh, some really, really late evening jobs, early morning jobs, to put herself through school and support her elderly mother and her disabled brother because she knew she wanted to get somewhere. And eventually they both did. They both actually reached this success in life. Uh, but that journey is often lost. And I wanted to start with some of these basics because really those are the foundation of loss. And for many of you, this is, you know this, you know, you've gone through this, you've experienced this. But it's important to remind ourselves that because if you're a leader and you're leading others and you're trying to drive change, you we need to remember these things so we can actually share this with those around us, especially those that are just studying in the industry or just getting into their first jobs. Um, oftentimes we forget it, and if we ground ourselves, then we can help those around us ground themselves too. All right. That's the journey, roughly, if I would think about it, uh, finding ourselves, mastering ourselves, and then, as I mentioned before, as uh, trying to drive change. The next, um, uh, I love math. Um, so I wanted to come up with some really simple formulas, what it means to be successful, ground us in a couple of the terminologies that I'll be using throughout our conversation, something that we can use in this forum as well. Great. Many of you have heard this. This is not new term. This became big actually, I don't know, a few years ago. There were a bunch of talks about it. 
But really what the grit, what grit means is having passion for something, then having the perseverance, having the strength, multiplying that by that strength, and then doing it over time, doing it over you know, whatever the period is, years, months, quarters. Um, that's what grit is. Then I wanted to also ground us on what being successful means. And being successful doesn't mean you have some sort of a talent or you, you're smart. Being smart and being talented by themselves do not make us successful, and you know this. But I think it's also important to remind us to those around us. Again, if we're trying to grow next leaders, if we're trying to make change in our environment, we need to be able to ground others in this path as well. So the way I've defined success for myself and how I do this with my teams, with the organizations I lead, is you got to have that grit. We multiply that by the talent that you already have or we already have. Um, we all have some talent. And what you end up with is skill. And then over time, you apply the same grit, the same perseverance to that skill. And that skill eventually turns into, makes you, helps you become successful, it turns into success. And I think it's important to know, to think through that and actually internalize that because success doesn't come easy. Um, and it's very easy to give up on it, especially in the tech industry, especially for someone who hasn't been exposed to technology, who didn't grow up with technology. It can be hard. So just remember those simple facts can help. Right. And I'm happy, by the way, this doesn't need to be like one-way conversation. Anyone who has the thought, what they want to share, just kind of share. Let's get the discuss, let's discuss it. Um, let's debate it. Um, all good. All right. So then I started thinking about, all right, if, if I, what, are, what does it take to actually to master our stuff? Where do we start? And um, thinking through that, passion. So you gotta have passion. You gotta know what your passion is. Can I open the discussion a little bit? You said grow up. Yeah. So the word passion, uh, I've been aware that it's actually not the best because it's derived in uh, biblical teachings that uh, are negative, and you know. So I think it carries an unconscious. Uh, like my passion is something I'm, I'm suffering for. I see. Whereas uh, I've been taught to use words like enthusiastic and bliss because it's a bit more positive motivation and that instead of like, you know, people like to create stories around their suffering and why that's their righteous path. Yeah. But being attached to stories that are rooted in something negative is not healthy. So... I don't no, know, it's just a little yeah. thing, but I like the word enthusiasm. I think it's healthier. Well, let's use that word then. Let's use enthusiasm. <laughs> and I, I want, I'll, I'll expand on it for you. I think it will become a bit clearer where the intention comes from. What, what the intention yeah. behind that word is. But yes, uh, I, I hear your point. Um, was there another? Oh, that's passion. Every people have their different passion. Mm -hmm. Like for example, one person has a passion of playing music. One person has a likes to has passion of coding, while the other one has passion of traveling and exploring around the world and learning what how to say that. How to what I'm sorry. Um, the people who travels around the world for the other one. Because some people, every people have different passions. That's right. That's right. So I, I want to share the intention behind that. And then maybe it becomes a bit more, uh, it grounds us in where, where, uh, where it's coming from. So, and the word, the use of word, the, the use of the word passion or enthusiasm or whatnot, it really is about what you care about. What do you care about in life? What do you care about for yourself or the environment around you? And some people, and for yourself, and some people notice right away. My father knew when he was a child, he's going to be a pilot. There was no stopping him. Some people meander through life, never figuring it out or trying to figure it out. I was one of those. I didn't even know. Um, and oftentimes, people expect there is these like aha moments, but sometimes it's not an aha moment. Sometimes it's you stumble onto something, you start doing it. And then you realize, oh, I'm actually 
I'm, I'm actually enjoying it. I like doing this. And you spend more and more time with it. You start applying more of that grit, more of that uh, practice. You start practicing that muscle. And it becomes, I think, it becomes something that you enjoy. It becomes your skill and it drives you to success. So I, I wanted to make that the conclusion that sometimes it's okay not to know where you're headed as long as it's heading and it's developing. And there's a second component of this, uh, which is how do you actually, how did I figure out or how does someone figure out, figure out where can I ground myself? Because there is so much out there. So that's why I have the core values. Because at the end of the day, there's a reason why we do certain things. And grounding ourselves in those core values sets up that foundation. A bunch of exercises online that we're not going to do that here, but there are a bunch of exercises that you can download with these worksheets. And essentially, what it is, and it's a mix of the core values and actually priorities. You start with a list of 40, 50 core values, the very standard value now. Then you narrow it down to 20, see what resonates. And you narrow it down to 10, and you end up with five at the end, maximum three preferably. Those become your foundational core values because everything else that's building on top of that. So then you know what you actually care, what, what you care about intrinsically. I'd like to add, I've done a bit of values exercises before. And one thing I found most uh, I don't word, enlightening is, so you have your initial values, but then upon each value, you ask why. Yes. Because typically we might not necessarily choose are inherently uh, our truest motivation. Uh, we're, we tend to be biased with how we choose. Oh, I think I'm like this. So right. What you would what you would like to see yourself yeah. as versus what you truly care about. Yeah. Making that differentiation. Mm -hmm. Can an individual actually say for themselves what their values are? Um, I think <laughs> it is possible if you're a very self-reflective person. Sometimes it's not as effective. And that's where you find someone you trust. Someone who knows us really well. Someone who can actually act as a mirror. Someone who can, like, I think I really care about our environment. Or I think I really care about money, uh, financial stability. And then they can challenge or they can almost validate that. So, but it has to be someone you trust, someone that you trust their opinion and they know us well enough to pose those questions and act as a mirror. But yeah. Yeah, it, it is not an easy thing. It's not an easy exercise, but it is worth doing because it, and it's worth doing it, especially for someone who is really junior that you're trying to grow, someone on your team. Uh, they may not have that foundation and they may, this may be an additional way for them to discover. And same with the priorities, making a list of like 10 priorities. I think Warren Buffett actually has this. He talks about a story with this, or his pilot talks about a story interaction he had with Warren Buffett, who we would call now. Um, and the advice was like, make a list of your top priorities, then narrow it down to 10 similar to core values. Then you fire, and then you end up with one to three. That's it. One, two, or three priorities. And then you actively ignore, actively ignore everything else, because everything else will become a distraction. Um, if you keep them in your back pocket, you're likely to distract yourself and let go of the most people. So this is just the grounding, again, for ourselves, but really, if I'm looking at how we can grow the team, how we can grow our organizational mentor someone, it helps to start with the basics. Um, most of you know this concept, growth versus fixed mindset. Um, and the concept that essentially what it boils down to is that our brains are elastic. We continue learning up until the time we die. Our brains continue structuring uh, and developing up until we die. Uh, this was, this is, this was, I don't remember exactly when this became a phenomenon and a thing and a proof, proof and medically proven. But up until that point, there was this uh, concept of fixed mindset. You, you have a certain limit in your life. Uh, after that, your brain is just not as flexible, as, as not as elastic, and that was proven wrong. So, Changing that mindset of realizing that we do have a growth mindset, it's not a fixed mindset, and then helping those around us realize that. And the way you do that is just like any physical muscle, it's practice. We'll talk about earlier practicing that skill. And then the second component that's actually really, really critical for this growth mindset is taking risks. 
without taking those risks. And again, we know this, but it's important to remind ourselves and then create the environment around us for others to take those risks and for people to feel comfortable to take those risks. No matter how big or small, that's where the learning will come from. And we celebrate fail fast. And there's like in the tech industry, this is a big thing. Also, it's controversial. You can fail spectacularly big and bring down a lot of uh, companies and industries. So I'm not advocating for that either. Um, but that being comfortable with the fail fast concept, as long as there's a good postmodern post coming out of it, or um, and not all, and safety net. And it applies to people too. People that you're developing, people that you try to drive change in, or the team that you're trying to drive change in. Um, the last one is actually in this matching is one of my favorite concepts, and it's about the energy level. So when we talk about growth mindset and grit and and just going after what you love or what you enthusiastic about, um, it takes energy mental, physical, and energy. And there's actually a really good way, there's a really important way to look at it. And this was, this came out of a Harvard study, Harvard Business Study many years ago. And they looked at the athlete, tennis players. They wanted to see what makes a tennis player really good, what, which, what differentiates really, really great tennis players from okay tennis players. And it was, the how they recharge themselves. But there's obviously meditations and breathing exercises and whatnot. All of those, the purpose of all of those is the recharge. And the reason recharge is necessary is if you look at this color, high energy, low energy, negative energy, positive energy. That's what it, that's what this color is about. The best place to be in, obviously, is the high positive energy. That's the performance zone. That's where you're executing, you're performing. All the cylinders are firing, combustion engines, everything is great. The problem with that is it's high energy, so you will run out of that energy. And building the practice of going into the recovery zone where it's still a positive energy, but it's low. So this is you know, can be things that you enjoy doing, hiking, or um, listening to some music, meditating, breathing exercises. Um, it can be anything that is positive, but it's not taking a lot of mental load. And the best people, people who have mastered this energy uh, component, they oscillate, they move between low and high. And that's what really high performing athletes do in the moment when they're competing, they're able to oscillate between those two. So another interesting fact about it, and they've done studies on this, the recovery zone, it's also where you do your strategic thinking skills because when you're in the performance zone, you are very, uh, it's the very this conscious part of the brain working. It's the, because you're, you're performing, you're executing. When you go into that low energy zone, it falls back into the subconscious. And a lot of those discoveries and ahas and whatnot, they happen in that, in that lower energy, positive energy uh, quadrant. So it's very, that's why it's really important to oscillate between the two. Because if you don't, if we don't, what usually happens is we move into the survival zone where the high energy is still high, but it's becoming more and more negative. That's where you know get shook, we become snippy with our teams, we may start yelling at our significant other or the kids. Um, you're still operating and you're still performing, but it's there's a lot of negative associated with it and stress, obviously. And usually what happens from there is a burnout. Your energy drops eventually. You run out of that energy and you drop into that burnout zone. And the way to recover from that burnout zone is to go into that recovery zone. So you still end up where you would have ended up if you could figure out how to process the two. There is no magical way to do that, like to remain in that positive side. Most people will discover it for themselves. Um, but it's, it's an important concept to be aware of. I just want to share to everyone the most life changing thing I've ever discovered is sitting on the grass. If you ever need to recharge, you can just sit on the grass and it will do. It's literally the, become the most important thing in my life now. It's it's kind of silly, but like we've become so conditioned to be detached from nature and physically connected to it. And I I, I, I just wanted to put it out there. Yeah, well, I, if you want to touch the tree, like if you will feel it, like you can just 
Yeah, yeah. There is a connection we have with nature. Yeah. Uh, nature does actually naturally recharge. Um, but for some people, it may not be that. For some people, it could be video games. It doesn't matter, whatever. And that's why there is no magic formula. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So our next meetup will be in the woods. <laughs> Can recovery zone be sleeping, or does it have to be something? Else? <laughs> it, it is a it is a physical recovery, but also a mental recovery too. So yes, it could be. It just you lose then sleeping obviously is important and it is a recovery, but you lose that component of the subconscious things moving in the back of your head. Uh, no, so but there are people who nice. discover things in their dreams in their sleep. They wake up and say, I solved the problem. <laughs> yes. Sense of recovery zone. Um, if there are many possible ways that people can recover with the recovery zone. Yes. Yes. Because when I talk from papers that after they write up some of the they go and my system people, some people to to take a break first. According to their documentation, that's how Kegel demonstrates the recovery zone. That's how what I'm sorry. Um, Kegel demonstrates the recovery zone. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, I know personally that when I spend time doing things that are directly part of the task that are more relaxing or in that recovery zone area, that I can actually construct a lot of the the actual answers for the problems mm -hmm. that I run into. I mean, I have slept and dreamt the code <laughs> yeah. and it's really painful. And I did that for months and months and months. But then I found that doing things like hiking also really well, really worked or going out and just taking a nice walk, things that just like center you, give you kind of like perspective on everything. And then answers would kind of pop in a lot faster that way. I wouldn't have to spend as much time stressing about trying to do it in the moment. And so, yeah. Absolutely. And, and one of the, I may have a very, very busy day for example, at work and at my desk, I need to get this strategy out the door. And oftentimes I'll swing my chair up and I have a big window behind my desk and I'll just stare out. And I'm lucky that my desk, I'm on the fifth floor in one of the Google buildings and my view is into the market field. So I can stare at the hundreds and the planes or the mountains. And I'll just stare for two, three minutes. And just like you said, as long as I'm not trying to think about the task at hand. It gives me enough recharge. And then oftentimes I'll get that like, oh, uh huh. Oh, to kind of give uh, evidence that I'm not qualified to say, uh, I've learned that the mind is not located in our head. And when we bring our perception into the window, into the mountains, then our mind actually can travel there. Oh. And so, uh, I find like when I put my mind in nature or something creative, then, uh, you know, it's important to remove our mind from, uh, you know, the unhealthy things because what we are is there when we put our mind there. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah, it's, it's, it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me for us to be able to just at least mentally travel. Kind of lofty, sorry. <laughs> like I said at the beginning, like let's stop talking about that. Let's get the conversation and the I think I have one kind of observation and question, especially during the COVID. I feel like a lot of people like they're attached so much to their phone. Like oh. as soon as it's so much easier to get distracted because at home if you're sitting in the Zoom meeting and if you get notification, it's easier just to turn off your phone and turn off your camera and do it. So I feel anxiety or anxiety, what it's called, it's getting more during the COVID. What's your thought on that? Like, and what are the, you see, the best ways to yeah. have more focused? Yeah, there, there's some controversial, uh, there are varying uh, publications on this. There is a school of thought that sometimes our brain needs that kind of distraction. Stare at the phone, scroll through the news or Instagram or whatever it may be, TikTok. And it is a form of recharge. And there's the opposing view on that, like it's not actually recharging us. It, what it's doing is hijacking um, the attention, hijacking, it's still using the energy. It's not letting the brain recharge. I don't know. I, I'm not a, 
I'm not qualified to weigh in one way or the other. For me personally, I don't find those things to be charged. Uh, and it is contributing more to a shortening of the attention span and the loss of ability to linger in that recovery zone for, for a long time because our mind is feeding off. My mind is looking for that stimulation. So it's going to try to keep grabbing onto something that can get it into the half high energy zone, which is not helpful. But again, there needs to be that oscillation, just like sleep, sleep cycle. Like there needs to be a way for you to move between high and low energy. And that scrolling, for me personally, is not. But there is a school of thought that it could be. So, well, no the answer there. Depends, I guess, on the individual and how they see it and how they use it. Um, all right, so then um, I started thinking through, all right, so if, if we've landed where we've landed, what a, how do we actually then apply this? So part of the talk was how do you drive change around you? How do you drive change within your teams, in your organization, if you lead organizations or the companies, if you lead companies? Um, I'm not going to, there's the usual change stuff. Just lump it all in there. You do a third. On Google or whatever your search engine is, and you say change management. One of the jobs I did have was leading a change management team. Uh, funny enough, but if you do a search for how you drive change or leaders that drive change or the how to succeed in change management, you're going to have a bunch of frameworks, a bunch of papers, and they all have different like three P's of change management, five S's of change. Everyone has like three clever frameworks. I mean, it's like the standard, you know, know why you're doing it, understand the why, the objective, um, have a framework, how you're going to execute it, uh, uh, start executing it, monitor it, gather feedback, then create that feedback loop. Like it's it's the usual stuff, but I, you can, you know this, you probably already know this, you, you can look at it and read it. What I wanted to focus on instead was the intangible things, things that are really squishy, we can't really put them in frameworks, Things that actually get us talking, um, things that I've learned again from my experience of being in situations where I've done things and I have failed, changes that I've done really horribly, trying to change the culture of a team or culture of an organization. Uh, yeah. And for a second, yes. um, I think uh, I know you personally, and uh, you know, maybe the team of like hundreds of people globally, right? So. Can you also like tell us about your journey, or like how how that has been, and how you like taking this and going through uh, like mastered yourself? And I know how big I remember when I just came to the United States to do my MBA, and I knew all by far because when Google was just becoming this really tough company that's super hard to get to. And here's an international student, a master's, a faculty master's in Dallas as an international student, and got uh, among a thousand applicants got into Google like 15, 15 years ago. Yeah, so how can you like tell us a little about your journey, like from there to from coming here and getting there and using some of these like mastering yourself, taking this? Yeah, I. I thought about doing two minute blog on that at the beginning, but I don't like talking about myself, so I skipped over that. That's why I'm not really I don't like that's, I don't know if that's, uh, I can do like a really quick version. But again, not again, not, it's not but about what were those me. moments. Yeah, yeah so it's not about me, it's more of like how I've applied it. Like, yeah, how exactly. I learned this, yeah. these things. Um, I think my journey is similar to a lot of the people probably in this room. I came with $200. I remember that two $100 bills in my bag. Uh, when I came through and uh, studying, yes, like the standard stuff you study, where there are a few moments in life where I talk about, like, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room, or you don't have to have things figured out. When I finished university, they offered me a job to stay at the university. And I worked at the University of Texas for a few years, and then Google reached out. Um, and they offered me a job that was few levels below where I was, there was a pay cut, and they wanted me to move to California from Texas, where there's a cost of living. Uh, it's a big cost of living difference. And it was the ceiling. I knew how far I could get at the university, and I knew how much I would learn. I didn't know what the ceiling looked like at Google. Um, 
And even though I was going from I was reading IT training department in uh, at the university, uh, the Google offered me come in as a level one support engineer. Um, and I took it. I took the job. Uh, I thought, you know, it's it can't. You know what the known is. You don't. I don't know what the unknown is going to be. So taking that risk actually led to what I was. And while I was at the company, I did the same thing. Um, that constantly driving change in myself. That stretching that muscle, practicing that muscle, and then trusting others to do that too. And because of that, I landed in positions and situations where they want me to come in and change the culture of the team or change the performance of the team. Um, because when you've done that, you've mastered with yourself, you've figured it out with yourself, you can empathize. You can empathize and you can actually coach people through that or mentor people through that. Um, and eventually I did a few things that I've had, had a variety of jobs at Google. The one before this was um, I was leading a risk governance team, I see this governance team at Google, and now I lead the IT operations in the US. But in all of those, the common theme has been what I've been sharing. So figuring out how you, how you, what are the things that you care about, and then taking those risks and stepping into those. And not all of those were successful. I have quite a few failures in that journey. But those failures are important. I wouldn't get, we wouldn't get where we are if we don't have those failures along the way. The intangible factor seems to be fear. Mm -hmm. So what would be a good question we could frame around how how do we deal with fear? How can we how do we create cultures of encouragement more maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Um well, psychological safety. What do you mean? So you we, we gotta create an environment where people are comfortable uh taking risks and you can't take you can't take risks if you can't be vulnerable. You can't be vulnerable if you don't trust the environment you're in. If you don't trust your leader. So as a leader, being able to know that everyone has with this fear, and everyone comes with that fear. We all have that fear. Creating and cultivating an environment, setting the example of ourselves of failing is okay. This is what it looks like. This is how we're going to create the support net under you. So if you do fail, you're not crashing into the ground. There's a safety net to protect you and you can climb back up. Um, and creating that environment of psychological safety. There are multiple components of psychological safety. You don't start there. There's there's a physical safety that you have to have that's given. Um, luckily, we're not in an environment where we have, you know, we're fearing for bombs falling and not whatnot, but you start with the physical safety first and you work your way up as leaders to psychological safety. Mm -hmm. There's there's tons of there's tons of materials on the actual practices of creating that psychological safety. But as a leader, it starts with us. So the way I've created that, cultivated that in my team is being actually very open about the mistakes, the failures, um, publicly acknowledging when I've made a mistake. With my teams, I actually seek the question. I may ask someone I trust to call me out on a mistake, to call me out on a failure and have a debate, open debate that then I can respond to and say, that was great. We learned from this. This is what I would do going forward myself. So it doesn't happen overnight. It has to be built up with the team. And then once that psychological safety is in place, the fear will not go away, but it is more likely that people will take risks. It is more likely that I will take a risk, that the team will take a risk for that change. So could you talk for a split second about what it's like to come into a new team and then establish that? Yeah. Um, trying to think which one would be. So the team I was managing before this, they asked me to come in because uh, the senior leadership thought half of the team needs to go. So it was a management team. And they said, half of those managers are good managers. Half of them, you got to manage that. They need to go. Um, and there was a perception of that region that I was managing where there was a perception of this region just not doing their way, not doing what they need to be doing. And it took, I want to say six months to get to a phase, to get to a state where it was clear what could be done, what can't be done. And actually there's a, I'm going to guess. There are these, there are three things I focus on. Um, but first, thinking about psychological, psychological safety, I was very open with them. 
Um, not that Kapodini, there's a perception of Kapodini Europe is just not doing great in the region either stuff, but more from um, we have this perception in our region. Can you tell me where that's coming from? Can you give me more about the background and the history? What you have experienced? What were your personal journeys? Where do you think things worked and didn't work? Most of the time at the beginning, there wasn't much. They wouldn't share much. They would share just enough to get me off the back, but not really open up. Um, and then I started sharing my own experiences and I started sharing my own mistakes and I started sharing, um, I found someone in the team that I felt who trusted and then built a report with them and become really, really open with them and leverage them to actually start having these back and forth conversations in an open forum that eventually others could join into. And once that trust was established, that safety was established and then the trust was established among the group, then I could go and start all this is where our project is not. Well, this is where we're not in the project. Let's actually figure out why. And people were a lot more willing to start talking through. Well, I think we're missing these deadlines. Because here's the root cause. And seeding, in a way, seeding the problem. Again, someone that I trusted on the team, I wanted them to, even if their project was green, talk to me if it's yellow or red, bring that up. And then like, okay, this is great. All right, there's a problem. Let's solve it. We now have something to go after rather than, Mike, your project is great. What the hell are you doing? So slow, but it takes time. It takes time to build first that safe zone and then um, trust for people to start opening up. So then you can drive speed. We ended up not firing anyone, actually. Everyone ended up saying everyone turned around their performance. And eventually, that team, that team became actually the highest performing team um, across the board. But it also took some time doing that as well, of getting the leadership. And this is where spending my own personal tactical help, if I have put it where I give it the same leadership, give us time. Give us six months to figure out what's going on. If I didn't have that, it would be obviously a bit a bit more Um, my question is um earlier you mentioned that you have changed your job. They went horribly wrong. My question is, what were the lessons learned and what strategies did you use to recover? Yeah, that was rough. That was very rough. Um, I advocated, there was a big project. We were moving from one enterprise system to another. And I decided during that move, it would be also great for us to overhaul the entire business process around it. And I pushed really hard for them to give me the project that I would do the business process analysis, and then we could make recommendations with the new engineering team. Um, I completely underestimated um, how, long, how much actually it took to do that analysis. Complete overestimation of my potential and my time, and underestimation of the scope in this case. Um, I, I did not engage enough with the engineering team, so I actually didn't understand their constraints. And, um, I relied a lot, again, on that personal credibility I had with the leadership, where they didn't actually question it enough. And I didn't have that sympathy yet, where they could have said, oh, you know, actually, let's pause this. Here's the pressure. If you can't get this done by XYZ, then you can pull the bottom. So it ended up spend, we ended up spending like six months. I ended up spending like six months trying to do this analysis, come up with these recommendations. The engineering panels were that we couldn't align to the engineering camera, so we ended up lodging it. It ended up being wasted six months of my, my time, plus a few other analysts that we had included for this job. Um, coming out of it, uh, learned exactly those things. First, what was the value in doing that? What was the reason for doing that? What were the hard pressures? What were the risk factors? What was the, who were the key stakeholders that we should have aligned with from the beginning? And then really, doing that, finding someone, and this goes back to taking risks, but also knowing when there's risk to the safety net. I didn't have that safety net to actually even validate or check some of my assumptions. So I ended up completely again the overestimation of my ability and underestimation of the scope of the work came into play. So one of the things I do now is like, if I don't know the space, I'm still going to go into it, but I'm going to find someone who knows a lot more than I do and bring them along with me. Because they're going to be my anchor. They're going to be my difficulty anchor. Anchor. They're going to be my sanity anchor. So when I go into this wild chase of this is what we could be doing, 
I can trust that it's me to bring it back to reality. So that was like one very practical thing I did after that. Um, and another one was being a lot more thoughtful about stakeholder engagement. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I, I do want to actually, since we started talking about this, I do want to talk about this this huge little triangle. And there are three components. When you when I was trying to drive change in a team or uh, in an organization, the first one was capability. So actually sanity checking, does the, whether it's an individual or whether it's an organization or team, do they actually have the capability? So in that, you know, with that team that I was trying to do this business in office, we didn't have the right capabilities. We thought we did, but we did it. So that was part of the problem. And capability is actually one of the easier ones to post for us. Um, and I'm thinking of some examples, bottom up um, can be creating more uh, networks, support network, a collaboration or brainstorming to understand what the gaps are and then address those gaps and address the gaps with training and the courses and coaches and whatever it might be. So it's one of the easier ones to overcome, but you do need, we do need to be aware of this. Like usually this is one of the pitfalls, one of the reasons changes don't land well. The second one of the triangle is motivation. Uh, when there is there isn't a motivation, there's an indifference. You detect indifference either in yourself or the team. Um, they have the capability to do it. Oh my word. Um, and usually that indifference is tied to culture. It's one of the hard ones because you gotta figure out what is it in the culture that's driving that indifference and address the root causes. And the way I've done it was. Um, both top down and bottom up. So that building that report with the team for them to be able to open up and tell me where they're where they're coming from as well as what the perception from the leadership was about the team. And the third one is agency. Um, agency is you you're able to actually do that. So the team actually has the agency to make that change. Um, agency by itself doesn't really it, it doesn't operate on its own. You have to have the culture components in place. And then you can figure out, is there agency or are the people actually able to do the things we ask them to? Do they feel empowered to do that? So quick yeah. question, sorry, came from online. Um, there was a uh, comment you made about your shareholders trust. Uh, and at one point, it was your, uh, not sure, stakeholders, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. um, stakeholder trust. Um, how do you regain one's trust uh, that's in that, that role? That's the question that came from my mind. How do you regain the trust? From your stakeholders. From your stakeholders. Oh, uh, yes. So, that's, that's so going back to what we're saying, that example, if I went back to work with that engineering team, will they trust again? Right. Yeah. Owning up to it. That's the only way. Like, yep, I, this is, I messed up. I, I made a mistake in this one. I screwed up. This is how that happened. This is what we're going, this is how we're going to do this different right now. And the second part as a leader that's really important. If you're the reason why that work is continuing because they've lost trust in me as an individual, second down, second away. Because at the end of the day, it's not about you, a person, a leader, it's about the organization, the team, and the change that you're trying to drive. So if you're the reason where the trust was broken, you need to give it space. I need to give it space and step back and let someone else. But yeah, the third thing was just only not to. <laughs> um, so thank you. Uh, there are, so this is, this was, I building a support network anytime you gotta have that support network both in the leadership team and within the organization and the individual. Um, I'm gonna skip this so that one is easy. This is actually an interesting concept too. Um, Prioritizing so this, there was a research done a few years ago. So we know about diversity, um, diversity of inclusions. Um, there's a general concept of diverse teams usually perform better. There was a research done a few years ago, and they looked at the performance of various teams and they looked at the diverse uh, composition, what how diverse those teams were, the composition of those teams. They were all expecting the result to be like that more diverse teams are performing much better than, and it wasn't. It was either the same or it was worse. So that threw everyone for a, that led to confusion because it broke long standing assumption that diversity or diverse teams have better outcomes. 
when they dove a bit deeper, what they realized was the missing component is this psychological safety. Diverse teams do better if there's a psychological safety within them. If that psychological safety doesn't exist, they actually do a lot worse. Um, and that was that's why that what we talked about that fear and the psychological safety needs to be the foundational layer of it. And we do know that um, different people with different backgrounds, they bring their perceptions, they bring their own values, they bring their experiences. And for some people, that fear or that um, hesitancy or the lack of confidence is going to be different. It's going to vary from person to person. So if you don't, if you don't have that psychological safety established, actually more diverse teams would do worse because they can create. There's not that would be like it's on another one hour conversation. Why? Why not? So just something to think about. Uh, um, this one is also really interesting. Um, it took me a while to get here, and it's less about you know scaling as in like delegate work to others. Uh, there is a very well known phenomenon if you're leading a large organization, or if you are in a large organization, the sphere of influence of a leader where they can directly influence change, they can directly drive change or influence culture, uh, starts dropping after about 100, 150 people. It doesn't matter how great of a leader you are, it will drop after that. It just becomes, um, there's too, it's too broad. The way to overcome that is through your leadership chain. And the way to overcome that is through that shared value, shared vision, shared mission. Because at the end of the day, it's not about us as individuals, as leaders. Um, it's about the culture to create. It's about the vision and aligning the organization and the company towards that vision, towards that mission, rather than the individual themselves. Um, and the most successful leaders, the way we know we're most successful is we step back and things actually do well or better because you know you've set the foundation of the leader. So this was a really tough one because we are, as leaders, you know, there is a certain component of like, me feeling pride about the team I built, me feeling pride about the organization I might have built or the product that I found. Um, and those don't last long. It's tied to an individual and it's tied to the leader as a person. They have short life spans. Um, and spending the time as a leader to one, cultivate that vision, mission, shared values, shared mission, shared vision, and then building up the leadership bank where they can continue that mission and vision to the ranks, to the ranks of the organization is the only way we can scale and then actually step back. Yes. Yeah. Uh... Thanks for sharing about this mission and vision. From what you just described, I am kind of uh, inferring that it's like top-down approach. Uh, do you believe in that kind of passing on the message or values, or do you, do you like to build the culture of the team bottom up? Yeah, yeah, of course. You can go both ways. Yes, I think sometimes you need. There are certain situations where you need these strong, charismatic leaders who do it top down. I mean, you know, there's a few people we can call out. Elon Musk, probably someone that comes to mind. Aside of all the craziness that's happening now, there are a lot of charismatic leaders, and especially when it's new, you need someone like that who can drive it top down. Again, I'm not saying the culture component of it, but I'm talking more about the mission. Like we didn't make work to go to Mars, for example, to build an electric car. Uh, it's um, well, probably accessible, so to speak. Electric car, you know, it's, it's probably so with that price tag. But that's sometimes you need that. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean that the bottom up, there are plenty, plenty of organizations, plenty of companies that have done it really well bottoms up. Um, I think when it's bottom up, one of the things is it's harder, it's harder to do it bottom up. And you probably, I would say, you probably start small with a smaller team to create that five mind and create that shared vision, and then you add slowly to that. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that both approaches, and you need both actually in, in large organizations, you need both. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And I think, yeah, I think that was the last one because I did want to end with that because it's not a very it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to do. Remove ourselves as leaders um, and let go 
Oh. And that's one question. So you talked about uh, taking risks and uh, learning from mistakes by doing postmodern. Post modern, yeah. So how how can we do it so we can get more most advantage from there? Yeah, postmodern. So I'll you to go on that because I know that many companies that do this really well. I think Google does it really well. And one of the reasons it's done well is addressing the fear component that you asked earlier. It's the cold blameless. It's very factual. This broke, this happened, this failed, and here's the sequence of events. It takes like an outage. At this hour, this happened. At this hour, this and this, uh, push this job, uh, so and so, roll back that job. And if it's an organization, so and so, um, there was a decision made to do X, Y, Z. Like it's very, very, very helpful. Then the next section of it will talk about um, what, when, what, what was the outcome of that? What was, what actually worked? And then what, where we got lucky and things didn't work. Are you, it's very methodical because then it removes the emotion out of it. And there's a very, there's a high expectation that the person doesn't get punished for that, for that mistake that was made. And one of the ways we've done that is we've actually celebrated failures and what we've learned from those failures. We published those postmortems. We did the analysis and then we published it because every postmortem will do that factual timeline. What was the effect? And then what are we going to do going forward, whether it's an organizational failure or if it's a technical failure? And then it gets published and it gets shared. And the really big ones in crisis, <laughs> the really big ones we celebrate as a team because it led to some sort of a break. Something like that. I also want to say on the bottom down and top down approach that I think a bottom down approach it can work uh, and I've seen it work and we're seeing it coming back right now is when your leaders are not saying this is we are a bottom down company so I'm not getting involved they're not in their highway powers mm -hmm. but they're they know every detail about what's going on in the business. And that's because they have a touch down, they have, uh, they're in touch with the very bottom of the organization. So the way it happens in our organization, for example, I have a department and it, and then I have managers who lead those people. And then I have those people that present their OKR directly to the president. I don't present anything, my right? people don't present them, my managers don't. And that they know everything and they're very people and very listening and very in tune. So and but like it's it's a great example of like how a bottom down can work, but mm -hmm. it's it's hard to master. It's hard to like as a manager not have your instinct feel beautiful before and to say this is what I did and then like how uh, question from online. Uh, Ada and Sherry are wondering uh, in regards to diversity in terms of. Is it in terms of background, personality, societal factors? What does she think about five people with diverse thinking from the same country versus five people with similar thinking from diverse backgrounds slash countries? Ah, uh, excellent question. So it's it's about it's about the it's about the diversity of the opinions and the experiences they bring into the conversation. So it's not just one factor. And actually, there's a really interesting. So that, since that's asked, um, so we're talking about diversity, there's actually a really interesting concept. Um, and it's diversity comes from the attributes we have. Like, and those attributes could be physical attributes, could be mental attributes, could be experiential attributes, the experiences we've had in life. Um, each one of those attributes, and if you think about it in yourself, you'll realize it too. Each one of these attributes can be a privilege or it can be a risk. It can be... Um, uh, a privileged attribute or an underprivileged attribute, depending on the situation. So that's uh, that's why it's it's not a one. Th there's not one definition of it. Um, some of us, for example, me being a woman, uh, that this at me my my me being a woman is going to be a privileged attribute for me if I'm talking to a group of teenage girls who are trying to get into the tech industry. And they look at me and like, as someone like, who succeeded, and I use my uh, my gender, my, me being a woman, as a way to, um, as a credibility piece. If I'm a woman and I am in, 
I don't know. I don't want to use tech examples, but um, late at night walking through a tunnel, <laughs> a dark tunnel. Me being a woman is going to be a very much a risk or very much an underprivileged attribute. So there is a differentiation in there with the diversity that we need to be mindful about. That every attribute we have can be a privilege or not. And that's why you know, that's why it's important to bring in all these attributes and actually land some of that privilege in, in the conversations we're having, creating that psychological safety. Going back to that psychological safety example, this is a very specific example. You're in the room. And you have someone who has an attribute that's made them underprivileged in that group, and you have the privileged attribute actually stepping in and helping them in that situation. Is that also true? It's the matter which creates a case of psychological safety, you know, um, especially when you have a diverse group of people, whether it's um, experiences, their backgrounds, their education, side of factors. Which also, the first thing is one that's got Hardware really bad hardware and those that good software and somebody else in there so we got yeah. to make yeah. relation. So they have to think they could that would fit together well. Yes. Absolutely. QA, they see things differently. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. 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 So it comes in many, many, many different forms, and that's the part that we have to remember. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, just touch the importance of motivation. Although I think it's important, but uh, I do believe discipline is more important. Um, motivation. Ah, okay. Think this way. Let's say you are motivated, you want to get in shape, to, to become a member of the most expensive uh, fitness club, you purchase expensive shoes, you subscribe to YouTube models, and you go to gym for 10 days, uh, you are motivated, right? Mm -hmm. And then you get sick or something happens, you don't yeah. go to gym for two days, then two days become four, then 10 days, then you, you look at that, oh, it's been a month, then you didn't go to gym. So what happens if motivation is gone? So it comes and goes, comes and goes. But I think it is overestimated nowadays because the real winner is discipline. Everything is yeah. based on discipline, even though you are not motivated. For example, I'm not motivated to go to gym tonight. I don't feel like it. But uh, if I am disciplined, I'll still go there. Yeah. So yeah. it is important, but I think real winner is discipline. Yes. Um, doing things that you need to do whether you feel like it or not yeah. it's like if you just remember remember that <laughs> the discipline will come yeah consistency or consistency <laughs> whether you feel like it or not actually wants me very interested in discipline right um it's a different thing from chess I mean, uh, people who are really multitasking especially when you talk about diet in Right, women of color or the minority, they have to work twice or five times more than the privilege. So where 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 do you get the time then to uh teach my philosophy, to take care of yourself, to do what good for you when you have to when you don't have the power dynamics, equality in uh financially or the respect to power without which how are you going to Talk, easy to talk. Yeah. Rather, it, it's a different thing to practice. Yeah, I mean, in terms of workplace, that, yeah. I mean, uh, in general, like, how many women do you see in what is the percentage of women on CEOs globally? How many women lost their jobs in COVID? A lot. 800 billion. Yeah, yeah. That was a financial loss, women lost. Uh, to this point, uh, it's then important to become important for everyone to recognize that and it's too bad. Exactly. So the so the bad the society has to be balanced. This 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 is the concept of winning privilege. So when someone's in a situation where they are more privileged, that particular attribute is more privileged, finding an opportunity to actually lend that privilege to someone else could be, you know. Uh, since a, a woman in a room in a room of board of directors where everyone else is a male, it could be uh, uh, it could be a black guy, a an African American guy who is stuck by police. Actually, someone who is who has the privileged attribute in that situation can step in and help defeat that situation. But I, I know that some of these are really really controversial, but I want to make it practical what I mean by lending that privilege. Being an ally. Uh, being an ally. Yeah, yeah, it's a being 
an ally. It's a very, and you, you, you being an ally by, again, you know you have a privileged attribute in that situation and you're lending it to someone else to create that safety net for them. But chances are you won't lose anything. Like exactly. That, right, because you've already got that. Yes. I've been in the tech industry for past 12 years. It's easy to talk about being an ally, but when you, your personal gain or when your promotion is at stake, would you want to be an ally with someone who is diverse, thinking different than you, bringing new ideas, driving change, or would you rather, um, yeah, just promote yourself, which is what bro culture or tech industry is right now? What Unfortunately, you, yeah. What would you like to see? Of course, change. That's what minorities are struggling for. So why do you think the tech right now industry doesn't promote like a leadership or has a broad culture? That's what we saw during COVID, right? I, I mean, I, I'm layoffs. How many layoffs happened? Who, who were the ones who were laid off? Yeah, but that's like an extremely broad example. I will give you like a counter argument. I'm I'm a minority minority. I'm actually promoted to management recently. I'm not fairly. <laughs> Uh, I only saw so many opportunities, and I want to actually ask you a question uh, before. If you can change, that's great. Oh, of course. You have to voice out. Other people don't listen. Yeah. If you intentionally added like the, the remove your soul part of things, uh, intentionally, because that's the most important thing, or that was just part of the. No, I don't think the, the outcome of you, you, you have to do that. I just mean, you mean removing our focus of leader, right? Yeah, part of it. Yeah, because I just want to give an example that I had an amazing leader uh, in my company. I work for a fairly large company, a former uh, tech. So we have a bunch of like yeah. employees. So I, I actually just realized that. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so my previous manager was amazing. He was able like to coach me to see some of my capabilities to eventually encourage me. Even though again, I'm a, like extremely minority in that particular organization. I have a lot of lot of competition. But I noticed that he left you a different offer. I got it so easily because everything was pretty much working by itself. So every single of the engineers, I, I pretty much had it, got that like um, honor gift. So right now I'm just trying to, I, I wanted to ask like uh, advice for young leaders because I want that thing exactly to happen again for whoever is next on, on the uh, on the chain. So any tips to pretty much keep building that culture so pretty much I, I can just, Remove myself from the equation and everything is working amazingly fine, which right now so far yeah. that's it. But and I have ideas, but if anyone else wants to share, I think give... one also saying like unconscious biases, which is, I guess, what you mentioned getting influence at every level, it's yeah. from hiring, reference, network, right? Network effect, especially for leadership roles. When you have your network set and you're a minority. What happened? Like people don't get the opportunities. That's why you lose diversity, you lose inclusion. There's economic disparity. All of it. I think and it creates. It doesn't change. I think one of the things, like having training enough in tech, like doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. They've been training for several years now, and it's always there's arbitration laws which silence women, silence minority. To voice out the discrimination, the harassment they face. I think that's the thing. Like I, uh, I, I experience. It's very hard to hold on to do that. I, I totally get to, uh, especially in tech when you walk into a room. Like I've been in a lot of situations where I'm the only one. Uh, but of I understand. And I think I really think uh, Mui just said that I think she was the CEO of Tesla. Like if you don't get a seat, uh, like there's no seat for you at the table, bring the whole day. Yeah. But you she, she, she has to work 10x yeah. times is harder. Do you have the time? Do you want to be equal or do you want to work 10x times? Yeah. Do you want I, to accept I, that? I think the personal preference, like I, I'm a hard worker and I think, but the thing is, uh, I don't compare myself to when I say like I work hard or a woman work hard. I just work hard on my internal feelings because I know that I probably don't belong, you know, when you have to be someone else to fit in, when you can be yourself, you belong, of right? Course. So uh, I'm always trying to find the allies who make me feel like myself, right? And that's Talking about important it. too. It's yeah. a tough way. Like yes, it is. Finding that and just bringing them, helping them, like bringing them along with your journey.
Yes, you're right. You're right. Perfectly right. Yeah, that's there was an article actually by Harvard's uh, one of uh, Harvard's professor who was studying about uh, diversity and inclusion, and yeah, um, it it was written about uh, the article was talking about how toxic and undeserving men are getting promoted just because of their gender or privilege compared to people like women who have to still work 10x times more and still don't get promoted. What do we what do we say for that? Yeah, I think uh, she did the thank I, you. It's a hard it's problem to solve. Yeah, it is. It is but yeah, change but has to start somewhere. Think, yeah. Change has so, to start somewhere. Yeah. Somebody had a question there? No, yeah. so we had the question yeah. about the skill. <clears throat> Well, I was going to make a comment on something that you mentioned because we keep talking about it briefly on the side. But one thing that keeps coming up for me when I when I run into how do you maintain something or how do you move on past a role or even how you keep leadership moving past a particular point, and it comes down to mentorship every time, being able to actually step up, find the people in your organization right now. I can't talk to you. But finding the people in the organization that are interested, that you want to take that next step and helping those people understand where they, yeah. where they can really help out and step up to it. I think your manager did a fantastic job of recognizing that you wanted to be in that position and mentoring you through that position. And it's something that we can do for everybody. It doesn't really, it doesn't have to be that you focus only on the people that stand up and ask for it. It's sometimes, I think, the situation that you're talking about right now is when you run into people who are asking for something rather than being recognized. That's basic. Because when we're in a situation where we don't recognize the people on our team for who they are and what they're accomplishing, then it's really easy to let the people who are the squeaky wheels take over. And as leaders, our job is actually to step down and realize who our team are, help those people take a step up every chance they get. I was going to ask you about servant leadership to see where yeah. your thoughts were on that. Yeah, I mean, that, that is, the kind of leadership is where it's not about you. you. It's about the mission. You're, And it's not about the team either. So there's a differentiation there. You're not serving the team, you're serving the mission and the objective of the organization. And that's what you're asking about. What is the mission? What is the purpose that we have? And then aligning everyone with that, so that the concept of certain certain leadership is that. One team, one mission. <laughs> yeah, so that's a really, really great point. Really great. Point. Oh, we're at the time, right? Yeah. 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 Thank you so Thank much, everyone. I don't recognize again all the workshop has been doing no. this, and it's no. a birthday. We have no. breaks over there. Oh, oh, no. No. Okay, I have a separate gift, but as a hacker, so just to me, that's easy. Oh, but then I got this. And probably you can do better if you want that. Yeah, I would really appreciate if you visit to me to join like the Moscow's such amazing place, so many amazing people and community, and it's non profit. So if you want to support, like that's the best you can ask for. Thank uh, you so much. Yeah, thank you. So we have all of them just we're gonna hang it on and just do more collaboration and yeah. Wait, let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. There we go. You need a group picture. Okay. Oh, we can do it. Yeah. Group picture. Which way? The tiger? Huh? Maybe easy towards the food? Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, if everyone could um, go by the cyber tiger. Yes, I can't wait to celebrate that birthday. All right. We're all just going to line up back here and take a group picture. I can't wait to celebrate that birthday. Come on. Everyone right here. Come right here. Who's going to take a picture right here? So we're going to stop recording. Thanks for joining and close the Zoom sync.
Uh, Alice, you want to minute here? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, let's. All right, future leaders and existing leaders. Say cheese. One more. And you need to be here too. Thank you to everyone who joined online. Thank you. Godspeed. Sako, do you want to uh, take us off, please? <laughs>